Travis Bader, and this is the Silvercore Podcast. Silvercore has been providing its members with the skills and knowledge necessary to be confident and proficient in the outdoors for over 20 years, and we make it easier for people to deepen their connection to the natural world. If you enjoy the positive and educational content we provide, please let others know by sharing, commenting, and following so that you can join in on everything that Silvercore stands for. If you'd like to learn more about becoming a member of the Silvercore club and community, visit our website at silvercore.ca. So I'm sitting down today with an extremely talented artist. He's a passionate hunter, passionate angler, conservationist, and even though some people may have not have heard his name, many people have probably seen his work somewhere in the hunting and angling world. Welcome to the Silver Core Podcast, Casey Brom. Thank you very much. Good to be here. It's awesome to be here. We're in your studio right now. This That's place right. is fantastic. Yeah, we uh, well, we bought this house in the spring of last year, and this was just studs when we got here. So this is all new, and I got to make it the space I needed it to be. So. Well, when I mentioned at the beginning here that many people have probably seen your work, there's one very popular piece of work that I think a lot of people have probably seen, and that'd be the Meat Eater Gnome. Yeah. So I remember um, when I first saw that, I'm like, this is, look at this cool gnome. He's got a unicorn in his backpack, and I think Meat Eater used that as their main thing for a number of years when they first started, didn't they? Yeah, kind of when they started becoming the brand they are now rather than just kind of the TV show and that kind of thing, but they're the big brand they are now. Um, it kind of just happened, you know, and it was a series of interesting events, you know. I was interested in their podcast for a long time. Right. And so I always had had it on in the studio. Um, and in 2018, I was doing a drawing a day every single day for the whole year. Right. I was going to ask you about that one. Yeah. That's so, crazy, yeah. by the way. So it was a big undertaking, but it was kind of like, you know, I'd heard of Inktober where you do an ink drawing every day for the month of October. It's okay. a, kind of a thing on social media in the art world. So I thought, what if I take that and, you know, expand it over the whole year? I'd heard people say that like Inktober really increased their skills or their confidence in that medium over a month. So I'm like, well, Let's do it for a whole year, every single day, start to finish, and then try to still do all my other stuff. But anyway, so I would have Meat Eater podcast on in the background each day while I was doing that drawing. And it was just kind of like, you know, catching up on old episodes and whatever. And, and they talked about, well, Steve Rinella kind of painted this scene in the podcast. He said, if I was a painter, is how he kind of prefaced the story. Okay. He said, I would create this image of, you know, a turkey breathing and gobbling in the early morning and creating like the 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 steam out of its mouth and right. it kind of described that in the way he does right? right um and so i hadn't started my ink drawing of the day and i'm like well that's an easy topic right there so i tackled it and drew it and posted it on instagram and meat did, eater found it did you tag meat eater yeah i just so, like yeah. hey you know listening to the meat eater podcast today um and drew this whatever and then it kind of just they latched onto it. They said, could they use it for their podcast tour poster? Um, and then, yeah, I got a call from Steve Rinella one day saying, hey, I have this really weird idea, you know? And what do you think of a gnome packing out a unicorn? And it's like, okay, well, that's weird, but let's uh, let's figure it out, you know? And and so that's kind of how it all started. And then it snowballed into a thing. And, and yeah, I've done a number of different images for them including mostly the gnome and a bunch of, a few other things as well. So it's crazy. Yeah. You know, I heard a, I heard a rumor. I don't know if there's truth to this, but I heard a rumor. Have you heard of, uh, Fenn's treasure? Forest, yeah. Yeah. Forest yeah. Fen? Yeah. That's right. Yeah. So the guy who found it said he was wearing his lucky meat eater gnome t-shirt when he found it. That's have, crazy. Have you heard that? I've heard that. And I don't know if it's like true or whatever, but yeah, that's totally cool. Yeah. That's, yeah. It, that was what, like a $2 million treasure that this guy oh, forced. Oh Fen. yeah. He, yeah. I'll just hide it in the woods somewhere. And then I, I guess what? He was dying of cancer and then he got cured of cancer, but he had already hid the, uh, hid the stuff. That's outside. right. And yeah. And it's full of like all sorts of strange artifacts and right. yeah. Anyway. So yeah. Interesting story. And I actually have another guy that's been sending me 
over the last like two years pictures of all the stuff he's accomplished in his gnome packing out a, a unicorn t-shirt because it's like his lucky shirt and so he's like sends me a picture of the big bull moose he got the first year he got the shirt oh, that's and like awesome. and like all, like he just sent me a picture today i think of him with his first bison he got the copper river draw oh wow. and he got a bison and he's got a shirt on and it's just like it's cool you know that is yeah neat. yeah it kind of impacted people and i didn't really expect that i thought it's a goofy thing you know and but we'll do it and so it was steve's idea originally the gnome totally i think actually it was like his brother's idea and he like kind of said like hey what if we did this and and then it just snowballed, and we created all these different images. And, yeah. See, I always thought that was your idea, that you just came up with this gnome idea. No, it was interesting, because it was like, you know, yeah, he called me, and it was interesting that it was him calling me, because he just had this idea. You know, the company was a bit <laughs> smaller then, and uh, he had maybe a bit more control over that stuff. Mm. And he was just like, you know, I have this idea of gnome pack, not a unicorn. And we did a few different renditions of it, a few, few different versions, you know, sketches here and there. Right. Um yeah, and then we finally landed on what became the gnome. Yeah. Well, you just came back from Haida Gwaii. That's right. And you were there for how long? Uh, we were on the island for four days, yeah. So you're, correct me if I'm wrong, you're a fourth generation hunter? Uh, I am I started hunting when I was 26 years old, I okay. think, or 27. Okay. So I was a, kind of a late onset, if you would, hunter. Sure. Um, and... It was, like hunting kind of happened in my family a little bit. Like my grandparents immigrated after World War II to to BC, and like hunting wasn't really that structured here at that time. Mm. And you know, so like my grandpa shot a moose once and they canned the whole thing, and that was hunting. That was the extent sure. of hunting in their family, you know. And my dad hunted a little bit, um, just kind of like grouse and stuff when when we were kids. But then I kind of started getting really interested in it as I got older and was like, hey, let's do this. And then when I started hunting, it felt like, you know, finding another limb that I didn't have. You know, it's like this is really? this is something so natural to me and feels like what I should be doing. So it was kind of one of those things in life where you just step into it and all of a sudden it's like, yeah, this works and this is how my brain works. And yeah. Were you, because I'm, I'm looking around in your studio here, like awesome pictures we got a goat we got owls we got wolves we got fish we got bears we got uh moose and cougar i mean very very wildlife themed for a lot of this mm -hmm. uh did that happen after the hunting or was that always kind of there it was always there like growing up i was obsessed with animals and birds and and you know my mom tells stories all the time of like when i was a kid being able to id like tons of different birds and stuff even when i was really young and uh yeah, I was kind of late coming up as like as far as reading and math. I was always really delayed in that stuff. Sure. Um, but I could like memorize all the different types of birds and, you know, was good at, oh, at drawing pictures and that kind of stuff too. Right. You know, so I could, I had that kind of knowledge, but was never good at, you know, the reading and math and that kind of thing. So, but that stuff's always been there, that interest in wildlife. And, and it led me to go to um, College for Ecology um it, at one point so then i worked in fisheries doing different fisheries work for private consulting companies really? and first nations for a while and so then during that period my art was a lot of fish because right. that's just what i was doing right when i wasn't fishing i was working with fish hands-on right you know and i would fish when i was you know lunch breaks and after work when i'm out in the field in all these awesome places right so um i would fish like 100 days a year or more because I'd be out there, right? I'd be working out there, and then in the off season from from work, I'd still be fishing. So just living yeah. the dream. That's right. Yeah, and then hunting kind of came into the picture, and my art did change. Okay, the the subject matter kind of changed a little bit, um, and I started seeing a lot more of like game animals and that kind of stuff coming into it. And just as your interests change, you know, it's kind of like I'm super interested in fish, and I did a ton of fish, and I get a little obsessed with like certain subjects for a while, you know. And my wife will even be like, Are, do you only draw sheep now? Or, you know, like, you know, like that kind of stuff. And I'll get into it for a little while. And then I'll move on to something else. And that's just kind of how it rolls. Well, you've so. done some work for a number of different conservation groups too, haven't you? Yeah. Um, Wild Sheep Society of BC. Right. Done a bunch of designs for them. Um, Rocky Mountain Goat Alliance. Done some work for them. Um, yeah. So that kind of is... Meat Eater kind of got me into all those realms as well, you know. I think there's kind of a door opening there from getting in with Meat Eater. It's mm. kind of like all of a sudden that world starts to see you a little bit. Mm. Um, but also just being a BC guy, 
getting on with different BC groups and seeing that I'm involved and interested in those things as well. So, Isn't it funny how one thing can open the door for you? Like Meat Eater, Meat Eater can help open the doors to the different groups and right. those connections in the same breath. Your artwork is opening the doors for other people. I mean, that, that gnome shirt and that artwork that you have, people have worn all over the world. And people have struck up conversations and been introduced to Meat Eater through your art. Yeah, it's kind of neat how it goes, kind of full circle, for sure. A little yeah. bit. Yeah. So yeah. tell me about Haida Gwaii. Um, It's a special place in the world to me. I mean, we always went there growing up as kids, you know, for like summer holidays. We'd go there every once in a while. Okay. Um, and it's just a unique place because, well, for a lot of reasons, I guess, it's an archipelago right off the west coast of BC. Um, and it's northern, but it also has really warm water going by it so you get okay. these really interesting weather patterns where you get like these this totally unique to the on the world in the world climate you know and so you get just like the greenest forest you've ever seen and and the thickest kind of jungly country you've ever imagined and cool. and yeah you get lots of cool wildlife encounters and giant bears that you know they say don't hibernate so there's just massive black bears there um really yeah so we just got back from hunting there and i was just kind of recapping to a different hunter friend of mine i'm like you can't imagine who's also never been i was kind of saying you can't imagine the bears there it's like we went for four days and i probably saw well we saw i think six bears total okay. of those six bears two were probably over 500 pounds whoa and the rest were over 300 pounds whoa. so it's just like you don't see bear quality like that elsewhere like they're just big healthy robust bears with unique diets and yeah and really long season for them to be finding lots of food so yeah a friend of mine actually were supposed to be up um, hunting with him in the yukon but they weren't able to they, they have a draw for uh, canadians that are non-residents of yukon that have an accompaniment permit right yeah and yeah, yeah so anyways so uh, weren't able to get that draw uh we're going to be floating down the Pelly river and uh, looking for some moose anyways and just helping out, even mm-hmm. though we couldn't hunt it. And then yeah. he got called out, he was flying for our, putting out fires and uh, kind of kiboshed our trip. But he was talking about a Haida Gwaii trip and the last one that he was on. And he says, you know, uh, his his buddy was with him. He ended up just sleeping in his vehicle after day one. There's just so many bears everywhere. Oh, yeah. And the bears are cued into what's going on. So if you don't know anything about Haida Gwaii, there's, tons and tons of sickle black tailed deer like they're everywhere um the yearly bag limit is 15 right you can have a possession of five so there's just like a ton of deer and the management is like get rid of them kind of thing possession of five Daily possession of, five. of yeah possession of five okay. bag limit of 15 wow. so you can transport five wow. but you can get 15 in a year wow right so that's kind of the setup um okay. but yeah the idea is to get rid of deer really i mm-hmm. mean they're 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 non-native introduced, and they've changed the landscape. I mean, people have also changed the landscape there with sure. some really extensive logging. But, you know, the amount of deer there is, it's a little bit bo- mind-boggling. Like, there's just tracks everywhere. Like, you step into the forest, and if there's a soft piece of ground, it has a deer track. Wow. Like, you just can't avoid it. They're everywhere. And, uh, yeah, so... You kind of imagine this world where there's so many deer, but the bears are there also. And the bears are really cued in to what's going on as far as tons of hunters coming. Local guys shoot lots of deer all the time. Mm. Um, and the bears have just got it figured out. They've got it dialed in. They follow hunters around. Like we've had that before where we've had to scare off bears that would just follow us all day. Wow. Waiting for us to shoot something so they could come get a gut pile. And there's lots of stories like it's a ra- when you get an animal down it's a race to get there like you got to make sure you don't leave animals to die long periods of time because right. it'll, ne- it'll never be yours a bear will claim it first Holy crow. so there's just a lot of bears and they've got it figured out um like we're looking at uh you know the poo piles from the bears and it's like salal berries, so it's all that yeah. purpley blue. Yeah. Um, but it's just fuzzy. It looks like velvet antlers. You know, it's just like full of deer hair because they'll just follow hunters around, <laughs> eat the gut piles, and eat up the whole hides, and then you know move on to the next thing. So easy. Yeah, it's really interesting, and it's just such an interesting dynamic. And you probably don't get that anywhere else. You know, it's really unique. 
Um, I can't think of anywhere where, where I've seen that, and I've yeah. never been there though. Yeah, yeah, no, it's really interesting, and just yeah, the size of bears, and we saw a lot of martin on this trip. Um, okay. So they also have martin there. They're really big, but they don't grow the big coats, so no one really bothers trapping them there. Right, they don't okay. get their winter coat because they don't get a hard winter. So, right. but yeah, really interesting to see the big martin. And we saw like usually there's martin around, but you don't see them. Mm. Um, but on this trip again, in four days, we probably saw six. You know, really? Yeah. Huh. Yeah, they're just kind of out and about doing their thing, and we'd see them in the early morning. Yeah. And in the middle of the day, we saw one sleeping on top of a stump. So that's not usual. No, <laughs> like everything there is just a little bit backwards, and it's yeah, it's really neat. Yeah, yeah. So, and you were there with your father? Yeah, that's right. Or yeah, the two of you? Yeah, yeah, just the two of us, and um, yeah, we were just camping in a wall tent, and yeah. So, with all the bears there, were you con- concerned about? We were camping, kind of. Right in town in a campground, we had electric, you know, we had mm. electricity, and it was pretty, pretty uh, chill. Um, that's not really my style of hunting, but you know, to be able to spend that time with my dad and kind of be like, you know, let's just accommodate that a little bit, a right. little more comfort, you know, and we can just stay in town and we can go out and you know have our days and yeah. So, what is your style of hunting? I really like backcountry stuff. Um, well, it's hard to say because I like backcountry stuff for like, you know, goat hunting and that kind of thing. Um, but I also like do a lot of day trips just because of where I live. It's all right here. You right. Know? So I can still be like the dad that picks my kid up from school, but I've just been hunting all day, you know? So it's kind of like... <laughs> it's not it, too bad. You know, I can I kind of balance these things a little bit. Um, like this big bear, there's a big, great big skull right here yep. um, from a massive black bear. And... You know, that bear was like, I put the kids to bed and was like, you know, let's go out hunt and take the dog for a walk kind of thing, you know? And uh, yeah, it's just cool being right here. Like I can drive out my door and be in good bear hunting in like 15 minutes. That's a good size skull too. Yeah. No, it's, it kind of falls into the Boone and Crockett 100 kind of list and um, yeah, no, it's a good size skull. You got those great big cheekbones and. I don't think the camera's picking that one up. It's yeah. just going to show us both looking at with admiration at a <laughs> skull. Right. Maybe I should. Do you want to pick it yeah, up? Yeah, yeah, sure, yeah. So, yeah, it's a it's a good skull, and it's got these, uh, yeah, really good orbital bones, and it has really good width, so you can kind of mm-hmm. see the width is really good. But he's a little short in the face, so it doesn't quite score fantastic, but it does pretty good. So, yeah. what was the story on that guy? Um, yeah, it was just like. Spring bear hunting around here is a big thing for me and a lot of people. Um, so it was like kids are in bed. It's 7 o'clock, you know, 7.30 or whatever. I'll yeah. just go take the dog. We'll go for a little run. I'll throw the rifle on my back and we'll see what happens, you know. And ended up finding a lot of fresh signs. So I got the wind right. And then, I, you know, my way to hunt spring bears is kind of like get in an area where there's tons of sign. Right. Um, which is usually the hardest part. Just find an area with lots of good, fresh, like super fresh that day sort of sign. Right. And then just slow walk into the wind, kind of still hunt almost. And yeah, walked right up on this bear. I shot him at 15 yards max. Um, and 15 yards on that guy. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So he's, yeah, walked right up on him. I had my dog with me. She barked at him. He didn't care. You know, he's obvious like king of the mountain, didn't care about who was there. Really? You know, he looked right at me, looked right at my dog who was barking, um, put his head back down and kept eating. Like, didn't care that we were there. Like, okay. Um, yeah. Took the, ba- took the bear one shot nice and close and rolled down a little hill. And then it was, uh, I think it was 2 o'clock in the morning when I was home because, yeah. Big bears is a lot of a yeah, lot of work. That so, is a lot of work. Yeah. So especially by yourself and spring bear, not as much fat. Actually, it was amazing. So this bear had, I think, I was looking at my. I try to keep track of all the yield from all my bears. Okay. So I hunt a lot of bears. So it's kind of like I like to. I'm interested in you know how much yield I get. Right. So I think I got 186 pounds of lean, like boned out meat, um, and almost 90 pounds of fat. Holy crow. Yeah. So, and that's on a spring bear. So that's he had, crazy. he had almost six inch, like he probably had four inches at his shoulder. And on his back end, he probably had close to six inches of fat on his back in the spring. I think I know we're going to be coming for spring bear in the future. Yeah. Well, you know, I also get a lot of spring bear that are as lean as you could imagine. There's right. no extra fat. Like I got a decent bear this spring, but the body was small mm. and it had no extra fat. And, 
you know, that sort of thing. So, yeah, it's kind of a balance of, you know, where they're living and what they're doing. But this guy had something figured out. Yep. The uh, the golden rule is be where the animals are and be when the animals are and you're, yeah. you're good. Yeah, yeah, exactly. No, it worked out. And, uh, yeah, he had a whole bunch of bird shot in his back end. Someone else had <laughs> scared had, it away. He'd had some, he'd had some run-ins. Yeah. He wasn't too far from humanity. So I think he was maybe visiting a few backyards. Okay. But, uh, How, yeah. How'd the meat taste? Awesome. Yeah. yeah. Fantastic bear. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's a, f- bear is always a favorite at our house and, uh, I shoot two every year. Um, often both in the spring. Um, I still hold one tag right now, so I'm looking for a fall bear coming yeah. up soon. But so I do it as well. Our kids love burritos. Yeah, yeah, bear everything. You bear know, everything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We do roasts and you know all the cool cuts like tongue and yeah and uh, heart and all that fun stuff. So, yeah. so you say you're looking for a super fresh sign. What are you looking for? Um, like really crisp edge edge tracks. Um, fresh. Uh, graze where you have no discoloration even lots of the times when they're grazing on like a heavy grass there will still be water actually wicking up the grass and just beating out of the end of the grass right and if it's been hours that won't be there right. you know so it's like okay that's really fresh and then there's like yeah scat that's super fresh you right. know like glossy and bugs are all on it still and you know all that stuff so that's probably like the first signs i'm looking for there's other stuff like really fresh trails where the grass hasn't sprung back but that's always like you know it's hard to say if that's yesterday right. or the day before yeah have you ever tried googling uh how to age bear scat no i've always just kind of like <laughs> gone by instinct i think you know because we have a there's ton of bears on around. there yeah i <laughs> bet <laughs> yeah i bet there is nothing <laughs> there really isn't maybe somebody better at googling than myself can find stuff but there isn't a heck of a lot of good information on on aging bear scat like is this an hour old is this four hours old is this a day old yeah what, what am i looking at here yeah so i think for me it's looking at like yeah it depends on what they're eating i guess but yeah in the spring it's all green right um so if it's not discolored if it's literally still looks green mm. then it's probably fairly fresh if it's really glossy and hasn't dried out, that's an easy one. I always step on every single one I see when I'm bear hunting. You're one you of know? those guys. 100%. Yeah, First of all, that I way can, you know. That way I know if I, I'm coming out of the trail yeah. and there's a new one. Yeah. If it doesn't have boot print in it, it happened while I was gone. Yeah. You know, there's that. Um, plus, yeah, you see how soft it is when you squat, when you step on it. If right. it's If it's at all firm, it's old. Right. You know, if it's really soft and oozes out the sides, it's fresh. And the, if water comes out of it, yes. it's really, really fresh, you know. And so, yeah, that's kind of how I've always learned to do it. And just being around bears, like if you're seeing bears all the time or hunting bears a lot, you'll kind of just start figuring out, you know, okay, this is fresh and this mm-hmm. is old, right? And it's hard to describe it, but that's kind of how I work through it. I was doing a spring bear hunt uh, close to the lower mainland and was with another fellow and came up a on a pile of, it was bright yellow it looked like banana it looked oh, like yeah. just squished up banana inside there yeah because yeah. all the dandelions had been eaten and and he's like holy crow how fresh is this thing mm-hmm. i'm looking at this like i actually haven't seen it that bright banana colored looking before oh yeah but that's fresh yeah right? that's right anyways uh and then we looked to her side and there's a bear yeah it, yeah um come back an hour later it already started to turn brown that's yeah. right. Yeah. It doesn't quickly. take long for the color to fade. Mm-hmm. So yeah, especially when they're on those greens or yeah, dandelions and there's flowers out and yeah, it just oxidizes and then it's done, you know, it changes. So yeah. So with the artwork here, you're, uh, I was looking at some uh, great pictures of Steve McQueen, that uh, fisher, <laughs> yeah. Brian, Brian Niska at the Skeena Spay Lodge. Yeah. We've been doing some fishing there with him. Yeah. And uh, his son's drawing some pictures of Steve McQueen, and I guess uh, he said that you taught him how to do that. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, Fisher's their son, and he comes here for lessons. He's super interested in art, and he, yeah, he just is really excited about it. So they actually pull him out of school every once in a while, and he comes here once a week at least. And, yeah, we we just kind of try to work with what he's doing and try to teach him new things and how to see shape. Um, young kids the biggest thing about teaching art is like just teaching them how to see stuff, you know? Cause if they, anybody, when I'm, I've, I teach lessons at different age levels. I did a artist in the classroom program and I teach adult courses, but it's teaching people how to see to make it easier to draw. 
Because if they can't see simple shapes, they just get overwhelmed by stuff. Mm. So yeah, it's when you're, when I'm teaching, it's about like, yeah, seeing simple shapes and being able to convert that into something else. So when I'm drawing or painting something, I don't try to just like imagine the whole thing happening. I try to little piece by little piece, simple shapes, and then build from there. So to teach kids that is like how to see those simple simple shapes and how to turn them into something else. That's that's the basis of it. Where did yeah. you learn how to do that? Practice. Yeah, just self-taught? Yeah. yeah. So when I was a kid, I just drew all the time, you know? So if I wasn't outside doing something, um, you know, fishing or hunting a little bit or, you know, we did a lot of mushroom picking and ba- yeah. blueberry picking and all that kind of stuff growing up, gardening and all that. So when I wasn't doing that kind of stuff, it was I drew and I drew all the time. And I, rem- I still remember, like, coming home from school, drawing, you know, like, all summer long. If it wasn't nice outside, I was drawing all day, you know. And I still have tubs of, like, stacks and stacks kept of it paper. All. Not all of it. It was, right. like, endless, endless. <laughs> but, like, I got sketchbooks and stuff from when I was, you know, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, growing up and stuff. And Holy crap. Yeah. And well, it kind of faded in and out. You know, teenage years, you're kind of figuring out what you're actually interested in. But, yeah, it always came back. Well, what kind of... Uh, turned me on to you initially was actually Brian. Mm-hmm. So uh, he was on a previous podcast and he was talking about spay fishing and and what it's all about. And it, I was, uh, I'm still pretty green at it, but uh, I was extremely green at that time, but I've been able to, uh, over the last few years, at least kind of figure out a few of my different casts and get the line out there. And right. actually caught my first steelhead this, uh, this summer. Oh, and nice. Yeah. yeah. Caught, Excellent. Caught my first steelhead on the Squamish and then caught another one and then, uh, yeah. caught into another one. The, uh, all on the same day. Yeah. So Excellent. That was, yeah. Yeah. Cool. Not too bad, but, uh, we're driving to the airport and Brian says, you know, Travis, you really should talk to this Casey guy. Huh? He says he's got a, uh, he's got an eye for things. He's able to go out into nature and be able to see things in a way that other people don't don't and he's able to put that into uh into art in a way that he hasn't seen anybody else do it and he was just going on and on talking about that and what really intrigued me was that whole concept of being able to go out into nature and be able to see things in a different way Mm -hmm. and you know some people walk outside and they'll see a tree some people see a forest some people see a part of it but everyone looks at it a little bit differently and it's that uh, that connection with nature and being able to increase that connection that I thought would be a really interesting thing from an artist's perspective. Totally. I think one of the things that I talk about in art and wildlife and whatever is, th- like I was just talking about, being able to see things how they are, mm. you know, and not letting your brain be lazy. So when I teach art, I, t- I constantly kind of have to hound people for not just filling in the gaps, looking at something and actually seeing it. Okay. Um, Because, you know, you use the example of a tree. You know, you walk outside and you see a tree and your brain just says, tree, tree, and is done. Right. And then it moves on to the next thing. Your brain's good at that. And brains are super good at that. And we wouldn't be able to function if we didn't have that. But to be able to turn it into art, you need to be able to stop and actually see it for what it actually is Mm. and the pieces and the real colors that it is. And, you know, like I look at this moose painting behind us, it's probably not in the camera, but it's all the whole thing. There's not a touch of green. It's three colors, you know, it's black, orange, and white. That's it. Wow. But somehow my eyes, you look at it and you see the green and you see everything because your brain's just filling in the gaps. Right. So to be able to just look at it and say, you know, those are trees and your brain's done. But really, if you truly look at it, it's just all oranges and these awesome colors. But yeah, these kind of surreal colors actually, but your brain just sorts of fills it in. So to be able to go out in nature and see that, it's interesting and it's cool, fun to teach and show people that. Um, it gives them a respect for what they're seeing, but also just an eye to see it. So yeah. you're one of these rare people who have become an artist as a full-time profession. This is what you do full-time. Is yeah, that- I mean, sort of full time. I mean, it's my job. Okay. Like, if I have to have a job that pays me money, this is it. Right. But I do a lot of other things to, like, you know, be my work. You know. Okay. So, whether it's food acquisition in different ways, um, you know, gardening or um, hunting or fishing or picking mushrooms or whatever it is, like that's a big part of what I do. Right. Um, and 
you know, this house we bought. I do a ton of work on this house, so that's a part of my job. I do a lot of the dad duties. Sure. So, you know, that's a big part of my job. But yeah, this is my my paying job. Yeah, if you want to put it that way. How you make your livelihood. That's I like, right. I like that. It's a good way to be able to describe it. So many people, well, what do you do? Yeah. And, and they describe their job. That's right. Right? Well, yeah. Okay. That's maybe one portion of things that you do for money, but what are you about? Yeah. And I think for me, the food stuff, like getting food by other means is so important and it's a part of how I make a living, you know? Right. It's not how I make my money, but it's how I make my living. Right. You know? And so that's really important to me. Um, and it's kind of something that I always grew up with. We always had a big garden and we always fished a lot, you know? And so that was always really, when I was a kid, it was kind of like annoying. So it was always a lot of work, you know, it's like, we got to go <laughs> weed the garden or, you right. know, all this kind of stuff. But as you get older, you kind of really appreciate that work. There's a know? Zen quality to it. There is. And there's something so natural about it and the food's better and the, mm. you know, and, there's some that connection to food just changes your outlook in, on the world. I think it's like okay, well, this stuff's important because that's where my food comes from, mm. you know. But that disconnect that so many people have, like you know, here's my food and it's just there, right? right? And I'm not saying we don't buy food; we buy lots sure. of food. But it's just different when a lot of your food is coming from something you've done with your hands, you know. You know, with our kids, we've done the same thing. We try and teach them an appreciation for the natural environment, a t- appreciation for what it is that they're eating and consuming, whether they're wearing it or whatever it might be. Right. But like where it comes from. Mm-hmm. Because then you tend to not waste it as much, particularly yeah. as a child. Mm-hmm. You enjoy it more if you've been in the garden creating it and helping it grow. And, and yeah. yeah. When they were um, quite young, actually, we took them to uh, a, uh, a a friend of a friend, and they had a farm. We'd usually get a lot of our uh, our meat from their farm. Okay, yeah. And uh, it was all because we knew what happened with the meat and where it's been. And, right, 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 right. And uh, anyways, we took them up there for uh, a Berkshire pig and figured we'd slaughter it and butcher it up and have them a part of that process. Mm-hmm. I took them around the corner for, for the slaughtery, but um, I mm-hmm. figured, eh, maybe a little young. They don't need to be seeing this, but yeah. for, for the rest of it, and you know, hanging it and... Gutting it out and butchering it up and, yeah, you know, just dragging it through the snow into the uh, <laughs> the big uh, trail it leaves. This is all a part of it. This was a pig. It was alive before and now it's dead. Yeah. Now we're going to eat it. And, yeah. Uh, it, it gives a far greater appreciation. And now that they're getting older and they hunt and they fish and, um, I mean, our son, when he turned 10, all he wanted to do was get his hunting license. And um, when he was 11, he got his first deer. Mm-hmm. And every meal we had, we talk about I, that hunt. Yeah. And we talk about, and it, it's just a very different connection to to your food and, and to the rest of your life, actually. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think so. And one thing that's really interesting to me is like the whole death thing is really interesting to watch kids go through it. You know, whether it's you know, we raise chickens here a little bit and, you know, I grew up raising chickens and we go to my parents who live here and go, you know, help put your chickens and whatever, all that kind of stuff. And, and for kids, that stuff is so normal until they're told it's not, you know, right. I think so. Like my daughter's six, she'll want to stay home from school to help me butcher a bear, you know, mm. cause that's like exciting and cool and she thinks it's really fun right you know and it's something you can do with dad and whatever but she's just into it and thinks it's super interesting and and like you said when when the food's on the table you can be like what bear is this from or you know like that right. kind of thing and that's really cool and you can see that whole story she's come along on hunts and stuff before too and been there for the whole thing you know yeah. like she watched the bear die and she you know was there f- to drag it out i remember the first time she was on a bear hunt that was successful it was like you know she was small and it was raining and it was all dead bracken in the spring so super slippery and it was a steep hill and so i'm dragging a bear in one hand and holding her in the other hand and dragging it down the hill and for me that's like such a cool memory you know she was just like a lot of work it's a lot of work but you know she she kind of saw all the work that goes into this food and how it all comes you know how how it gets to the table and i thought that that was so cool yeah there seems to be a, a disconnect between life and death from mm-hmm. as time goes on and people just buy their food from the grocery store. Mm-hmm. Uh, and when they co-op the responsibility of the actual killing of the animal to somebody else, but they still want to consume mm-hmm. 
the animal. Right. Yeah. And, you know, I, I've read some literature on it and I don't know how much of it's biased and how, but they, they talk about how death becomes a very closed door process. Mm-hmm. Uh, it used to be people. Open ca- caskets were were uh, quite common. Some cultures will have the the body on a bed for X amount of days, mm-hmm. and people will come by and view it. and And there's an understanding that we're alive, we die. That time in between, we try and make the most of it. Mm-hmm. Um, when we start closing those doors, and that whole death process becomes such a taboo thing, um people are postulating that the value of life is diminished. Hmm. You know, people, people's value of other people's lives and other animals' lives is, becomes less because they don't, um, uh, they don't have that understanding in the same way that somebody growing up in a farm might. That's right. And I think, you know, I have other friends that have also gotten into hunting um, from even more of like a non-hunting background and having the background that I did, you know, where we, we, we butcher, I, I raised meat rabbits growing up as a kid and we raised chickens and all that kind of stuff. And, and being there for that, I wasn't complacent to death, but I just understood that it was part of the process, mm-hmm. you know, and other people were coming in from a background that didn't even have that aspect of it. And they came into hunting and the whole death thing was new and a little bit uncomfortable. The only other death experiences they'd had was like, people, family members or mm. pets, you know, right. which is different because it's, you have a Huge family connection. connection. Exactly. So it's like, well, this is, this is different. Mm. You know, this is very different from that. There's kind of a means to an end. Right. Mm. And th- I don't, I don't want to say that that death of animals don't, doesn't impact me because it definitely does. And as a hunter, it impacts me more now than it did. Um, but yeah, there's s- just a certain understanding there where it feels natural. What right? do you mean by that? As a hunter now, it impacts you more than it did. Well, I think maybe it's just getting older too and kind of understanding the, the finite life that we live here, you know, mm-hmm. this, this kind of like flesh and body form of us is not forever, you right. know? And so for me, it's kind of like, yeah, like there's this respect for the animal's life that I've gathered as i spend more time with them Mm. you know like on a spring bear hunt i'll see a lot of bears you know and i'll spend a lot of time watching them or just looking at them doing their thing or you know that sort of stuff so it's kind of like you you grow this bigger and bigger connection and as as i've killed more bears too you kind of see each bear and how individual it is they are you know each bear has i mean i look at the skulls around this room like you know this one behind me um is missing half of its bottom jaw because it was in some scrap along the way, mm. you know? And, you know, this one over here has a broken orbital bone and different ones had tons of scars on their face or an mm-hmm. ear missing or, you know, a toe missing. There's just stuff happens. Mm-hmm. And so they're all like, they've lived their lives. And the more I think about that stuff, it's like, okay, well, maybe I have a bit more, um, yeah, emotional connection to the life and death. Interesting. Uh, yeah, yeah. So. Yeah, they... Um a friend one time, he was talking about how death is the only thing that gives life value. Mm-hmm. I said, well, how, what do you mean? Yeah. Death's the only thing that gives life value. And he said, right. well, think of it, about it like money, right? Right. If there's a finite amount of money, that money now has value. Yeah. It's, if there's an infinite amount of money, it would be worthless, That's right. right. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Good point. Yeah. And it kind of gives you a motivation to think about this life and what it means and, and yeah time spent here you know totally so, yeah so you're you know I, I i seem to recall you having some artwork in the airport yeah 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 um you're working on a mural right now are you uh, i'm not i'm not working on a mural right now i'm planning a mural um always i guess planning a mural right. um so working towards you know what happens next summer i don't have any big outdoor murals booked for next summer um so I kind of don't know exactly what's happening there, but you know, there's, there's balls in the air, but mm. nothing kind of nailed down for next year. Um, but yeah, I am working on another indoor mural coming up and yeah, murals are a fun and interesting project, but yeah. 
So uh, a while back, it's going back a while now, actually, a year, maybe more, you created some uh, custom artwork for uh, for Silver Core for a project that we've been working on for the last few years now, which is getting close to fruition. Oh, so excellent. Yeah. We'll be launching that hopefully soon. So people will be seeing your artwork in conjunction with some of the uh, uh, the endeavor that we're doing for our club members. Mm-hmm. And uh, I it's finally at a point where I can start talking a little bit openly about this and oh, good. realizing that it's, uh, we're just about there to, uh, to unveil. So that'll be a lot of fun. Uh, but if people wanted to check out your artwork or purchase your artwork, how would they do that? Um, well, currently I have a under construction website, so we'll just kind of forget that that's, <laughs> forget that that's a thing. Um, but Instagram and Facebook right now are kind of my biggest means of connection with people. Um, it's just kind of a natural place to show your work and for people to engage with it a little bit and that sort of thing. So, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, if they wanted to purchase something, there it's got to wait for the website to come back live? Yeah, or send me a message. You know, there is kind of stuff posted for sale on Instagram and that sort of thing. So, there's work available there. I do take commissions. I'm open for commissions right now. I kind of turn that on and off. Um, but, yeah. So, that's kind of the main means right now. Awesome. Yeah. Is there anything that we should be talking about? I know we kind of, we talked briefly about Haida Gwaii there. You guys were obviously successful. You guys both limited out. Well, we didn't limit out. We took seven deer home. So we, uh, yeah, I got four and my dad got three. Um, but yeah, successful trip and, you know, good memories made and all that kind of stuff and meat in the freezer and. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So good you're, trip. you know, I've talked to some people and they said, oh, man, there's so many deer there. It just makes more sense. There's a guy on the island for 50 bucks. He'll dress them all out, take care of your deer all for you. Oh yeah. Um, that way you're back. If you're on a limited time frame here, yeah. and you're back out hunting again. Yeah, yeah. But I take it you guys took care of it all yourself. Yeah. We, I do everything, you know, from the field to the table. Yeah. Um, all my butchering, wrapping, everything happens here. So yeah, I just like being, I like the whole process. I agree. You know, when I'm out with my dad and my brother hunting or someone else, I'm usually the guy doing the most of the cutting because I just really enjoy it. I think mm-hmm. it's really interesting. And oddly, from an artist's perspective, it's also very educational. Um, oh, it's interesting, like Da Vinci. Yeah, so you're kind of like <laughs> seeing the way all the muscles connect and, you know, the way, you know, things move around and, yeah, exactly. So it's kind of like you're breaking this thing apart. And I, I am definitely taking mental notes of like, Hey, you know, maybe I've been drawing that wrong. You know, now that I peel the skin off, this does move different than I've been drawing right. it. You know, stuff like that. So I don't think about that all the time, but definitely I'll just kind of like happen upon something and be like, oh yeah, you know, like that's kind of cool. But yeah. You see Da Vinci's uh, diagrams? That oh. Of, like, just like insane. Yeah, that was, that was pretty standard protocol. I mean, th- that's how you used to learn how to draw people, you know. You that was would it, get, eh? Yeah, you'd get cadavers and you there would be whole teams of artists that would gather around in renaissance times too and like there's painting rembrandt has paintings of it happening you know he'd paint the whole crew there'd be a big group of artists and a couple doctors and they'd you know take someone apart good and, dutch artist yeah that's right another good dutch artist <laughs> yeah <laughs> and so you kind of see that you know that's that's a way of understanding your subject matter but very cool yeah was well, there anything else we should be talking about before we look at wrapping things up here yeah, I don't know. I don't think there's anything really in particular. Um, yeah, no. Awesome. Well, uh, when your website's back up, we'll make sure we'll have links <laughs> over to that so people can see it. We will have links to your social media. So yeah, that sounds can, great. They can follow everything along there. They can reach out to you. Yep. And uh, they're going to see some of your work on the Silver Course site in not too distant future as well. Excellent. Yeah, that was a fun project. Um Kind of a unique challenge of like, hey, take on these things. And yeah, no, really fun. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Casey, thank you very much for being on the Silver Pro Podcast. Oh, it's been really good.